The Golf Biz with Mikey D, Drew, and the crew. Management, marketing, myths, and morons. Hope we make you smile. Welcome to The Golf Biz. I'm Joe Dahlstrom with Mikey D, Drew, and the crew, where our one and only goal is to make you smile as we share our stories of owning, operating, and marketing golf courses all over the town. Drew, what's up, brother? Not a whole lot. We're, uh, we got some sunshine again. Um, definitely, I'm going to go ahead and start us off, too, with the birdies and bogeys. Last week, huge bogey. We had our first rain out of, well, I guess we didn't have any of 2020, yeah. but <laughs> we had our first one of 2021 already. Um, and this year, because there wasn't so much rain, I think no one even pushed the envelope. We Last year, we had like 50 to 100 golfers every day there was rain. Um, this time, everyone said, you know what? It's the only rain in the forecast for the year. Let's just not push it. Um, but the great news is we're back and everything's looking good. Birdie is um, the driving range is looking fantastic. Top tracers getting a lot of traction and uh, the new turf we're putting in and expanding the back of the range. Everything at the ranch is going great. Absolutely. Mikey D out in uh, sunny FLA. How's everything going out there, brother? Absolutely, man. The sun is shining and the balls are flying, man. We are crushing on top of crushing stacks on stacks, as we say at the Nash, baby. Birdie of the week, man. We had the good, good guys out here. I didn't quite know just how cool they were with GM Golf, Kyle Berkshire, and that whole crew. Shot some awesome footage and some great content. They they posted it now, and it is just exploding all over YouTube here at the Nash. Plus, their feedback was super cool. Bunch of young, kind of cool, hip dudes. Um, and they all said that the Nash is by far the place to be. So that was a super birdie of the week. Stogies, um, of course, Joey, you know what? The passing of her dad is a monumental bogey. Um, but the birdie of it all is that the story had to be written and there isn't a page we would change. And uh, the fact that we had our dad as our dad is pretty awesome, dude. So Absolutely. a birdie, a, a, a definite quadruple turned into a birdie. Absolutely. No question about it. Uh, my birdie is that after the good, good thing, we are trying to get a match, the golf biz versus the good, good guys. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, I yeah. think that it'd be epically cool. <laughs> you know, it, uh, and we're going to need a lot of strokes. Dude, no doubt. I'm on the team. Yeah. Hey, I'll cover Berkshire. You got GM golf and you could cover one of the other dudes. You right. got that? Yeah, I want Team Underdog. That's who I want to go against. Yeah. The <laughs> bogey of the week is that Mikey's the one negotiating this deal, oh, so I don't no. like our chances. So, uh, Mikey, <laughs> just slide them slide over to me, all right? Because I don't think that, well, dude, I, yeah, you, I, you know, these guys are really good players, supposedly, long world drive champions and stuff like that. And then you got us, right? So... I'm an old bald guy that plays twice a year. Drew's been playing for a total of a year. And uh, Mikey, you don't know if he's going to quit after hole three, five, seven, whatever, right? <laughs> <laughs> True that, dude. I'm a quitter, not a loser. Let's be clear about that yeah, one. That's All the right. family motto. Yeah, let's get started, right? Yep. We're the not so silent business killer, the annual membership. This is one that uh, I have really looked forward to talking about. Uh, yeah. Drew, it's a this little a bit of a new for topic you. for you, but it is a hot topic for me, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I want to do a full disclosure here. When we start talking about the annual member, it's the product or the program, not necessarily the person. Although the product can actually have a negative effect on the person. <laughs> yes. No. And, and in just the prep work, we've talked about this yeah. a little bit. I've had some, uh, some memories come to my mind where, you know, I've always thought I was a nice person and a good customer, but there were definitely times where, you know, I subscribed to some of these failed business models because it's a great deal for me. And I don't blame yeah. anybody that finds a good deal and, you know, take advantage. I mean, that's what it's Absolutely. there for. Yeah. But, you know, I definitely saw and thought back to, wow, I really didn't treat those people very well because I felt pretty in titled and it is an interesting point too for sure yeah the m word you know remember yes. it is one that we try to avoid at all costs because it really does build this entitlement and like that you get a say a vote and everything else and so for everyone out there that's a member of a private club this is not about a private club where if you pay a lot of premium you pay a large initiation fee large monthly dues you get assessed that is a private club get that yeah no problem you deserve a say you bought it you paid for it great what we're going to talk about today is really a business model. And I think it's one where 
uh, you know, somebody comes in and they're operating this golf course and it's kind of the easy way out, right? You create a product where there's no initiation fee and it's really low dollar and you sell a hundred of them. You think your life is, is great. Right. And then you, you look at it, they take up all the prime tea times, they take all the inventory. And at the end of the month, you realize you ain't doing so hot. Right. Yep. So, you know, Mikey, we've been at a lot of golf courses and, you know, because we do our deals paid, paid on performance, we almost like when the people before us create this membership program, right? So, you know, share That's a little it. bit of uh, some of the things that you've experienced, you know, when you walked in, you saw this, these annual members. The, uh, yeah, to overcome that is a, is a big challenge. And then to then create programs that people want and that do actually help the club as far as pay as you play programs are great. Um, but yeah, they, they book for 16 golfers. They show up with 12. They, uh, they typically, you know, especially now what we're overcoming with everybody wanting their own golf cart that they feel like they're entitled to their own golf cart. Um, and so there are some things there that are actually significant to just operationally um, to actually wanting to express the fact of why somebody is parked too close to the green when the reality is they park even closer to the green. Um, <laughs> and so with that, actually, when they share those things with you, I just want to make it, sh make, make it clear. And when we do come into whether it's a new property or that, make it very clear that we actually call it an annual pass if we do have one there than a membership. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and Drew, you've been in the business, not a, an extent, a massive amount of time, but you've been in business, you've run businesses and things like that. So it really comes down to business model yeah. um, because, you know, when they sell these products and, you know, they, they call it the member and they, and they build this and they, these people are viewed as loyal, right? right. And, you know, it, I think that it's just, it's poorly done because it doesn't accomplish really much, but you know, even at uh, Dobson, um, you know, we have people that buy the card and stuff like that. But, yeah. you know, overall, I mean, you can see how it, the entitlement actually can affect an operation. For sure. And it really is something as simple as using a word like member versus just kind of framing it a little bit differently. And, and for those of you out there who maybe have never listened to us or maybe you do for other reasons, this is something to be clear. It is not just golf. This could be about gyms. This could be about subscription service. This could be about a lot of different business models. Um, but definitely when you were mentioning, you know, I think this all came about, I'm just guessing here, but a long time ago when people started these memberships, to use the word member gave people, it made them feel good. Right. It gave them that entitlement and they wanted to create the loyalty for sure. Um, but just the air that kind of lingers around that word member, um, that is one of the kind of mindsets that really does sort of bring the bad or, you know, it, it starts to seep into people's attitudes and they feel a little too entitled or, and, you know, then they can start almost abusing their memberships and things like that, where it's set up almost exactly the same. Some of the times with things like the ranch card or whatever it is. And, and the main goal from a business perspective, right, is you want to get something tangible into the the customer's Absolutely. pocket or into their life. So when they wake up and we say, Oh, Mikey, where do you want to go play today? You're going to say, well, I bought that stupid card at Dobson. I might as well <laughs> go use it. Or, you know, yeah. that's the end goal. Yeah. Um, and if you know, it, you achieve the same thing by calling them a member and they actually, in the beginning, they stand a little taller, they have their shoulders yeah. back. They say, man, I'm a member over at Dobson. It's so cool. But then, you know, it starts to snowball a little bit. Absolutely. And that's when, you know, well, now it becomes exclusive. Now it's mine, mine, mine. Yeah. And it's supposed to be a public or a semi public course or yeah. whatever it is. And then they become protective and they don't want other people to be members. And I've even had people say really nice things about Dobson and even the other businesses I've worked at. And I said, Hey, you know, that would mean a ton to us. You know, if you just could share your story, leave us a good review, whatever it was, they said, Oh no, I'm actually going to go leave a bad one. Cause I don't want people to come here and ruin it like those, but that's real. Like no, people say that and they think that way. Absolutely. Um, you know what I mean? And then, you know, and it, it's, we, we believe in treating everybody with ultimate respect, having a great time and having fun. So if this isn't how you treat, you know, if you run a golf course, own a golf course, this isn't how yeah. you treat them. You treat everybody amazingly well. But here's where in a daily fee, high volume golf course, where it can be detrimental, right? Mm -hmm. And actually really destroy your business. When you, the member feels entitled, right? They want to give an opinion on the green speed. They want more spunker sand. They want all these things, right? And then they share it with the leadership team, right? Mm -hmm. So then the leadership team spends 
80% of their time trying to facilitate the needs of this group of people. And they're not focused on what's most important. And that's service sales and making the experience great for everyone. Yeah. And then you just look at the pure financial side of it. Right. So, you, you know, they price these things and because there really isn't, in the golf business, you know, when it comes to entrepreneurial sales and service and marketing, it's really just not there, right? So they price it so it's real easy to sell, right? Yeah. And I can tell you this, it's not a loyal customer when they actually do this. They actually say, well, it's this much per month if I play this many times. And if it's under $10, they're in, mm -hmm. right? That's not a loyal customer, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that customer's bad because, hey, maybe I'll do that too. But right. that's a program you don't want to create because if you don't understand the value of every tee time, Every, during every season, if you don't understand that and your leadership team doesn't understand that, it doesn't take long to figure out that these programs for two, three, four hundred bucks a month and they take and they get all these benefits and then you can't sell it for the premium rate. It does. It leads yeah. you to uh, insolvency. Yeah. Pretty soon there won't be a golf course for everybody <laughs> to enjoy. That's that's the unfortunate moral of the story or any business. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Joey, really too, and, and onto your note about the, about the loyalty and actually the dollarization of it, what's most flawed about the program itself is that it really, uh, it excludes the guy that may just look to go ahead and play a couple of times a month to once a week. It really excludes that person because nobody's going to want to come up with three or 4,000 bucks for an unlimited pass if they're just a recreational golfer. It's really comes down to the guy that's going to dollarize it that plays three to five times a week, taking up all of that prime inventory. And so that's what's really flawed about the product is that it's not even designed to really um, uh, attract the masses or an inclusive program. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, and if you're going to do one of these and it's important to you, I would look at your your flow and where your highest uh inventory, your highest valuable tee times and actually price them accordingly and then use some type of an annual, I'd call it a pass. I think we all agree on that. Yeah. But hey, if you want to call it a member, that's your thing, you know, but you should use it to fill your off peak times, mm -hmm. right? If you're going to go ahead and give a low dollar product uh, uh, and then you're going to go ahead and use it to target your off peak times, the ones that you can't sell or you have to severely discount it to so you can have your prime inventory, you know, and there's a lot of misnomers that, you know, they spend all the money and all that. And then it's just not true. And just for all the people that actually in the association groups adopts and we're not referring to you. It's, it's, you're a member of the club. We love you. You guys do spend money and you're great. Just, I wanted to qualify that. <laughs> this is when yeah. they put together, like Mikey referred to, it's $2,500 for unlimited golf range, locker, everything for the year. And then right. they come out and play and it even affects your range. Right. And then, you know, if you have limited spaces on your range, it's all taken with guys that already prepaid you at a very, very low price. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, no. And I mean, even there's even other things out there, you know, not just an annual golf membership, but even something as small as 50 bucks a month and you get unlimited range. Well, I can tell you when we go through our range balls, we're cleaning them. We've got about seven different kinds of range balls. And I can only imagine it's because people have those memberships, maybe elsewhere. Yeah. They go hit about 10 balls, put 50 in their bag, come out and we have grass, we have lights, whatever it is. Maybe we're open when that place isn't. Yeah. And so they bring the balls, they tear up our grass a little bit and it's just, you know, it, it's funny to see for sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely something that at first it sounds good, right? You're right. getting all this money up front. You think there's no way it's almost like an all you can eat buffet. Yeah. The whole point is, you know, 20 bucks, you get unlimited food. You just got to clear your plate. You can't take anything home. And they know that you're not going to eat more than $20 yeah. worth. You just can't. Absolutely. But this doesn't really work that way because there are people that will come to the range all day long, right. every single day. There are people that will play two, three times a week or even two times a day when they have time. And uh, yeah, it's definitely something you got to consider long term instead of just being short sighted. Absolutely. And there's there's people out there that might be doubting like uh, what we're saying, because they're confusing an annual membership and something like this with a subscription model. Right. Mm -hmm. Like a gym. I get that model because gyms are uh, accessible and, you know, just a, everybody at least wants to think like they're going to exercise. Right. But mm -hmm. a small percentage under 10 percent play golf on a regular basis. Right. So a, a subscription model, when you have unlimited space, it's open 24 hours and things like that. And you could charge a low, low fee where it doesn't take much. Who, you know, you just say who cares is 20 bucks. Right. Mm -hmm. But I can I guarantee it that if anybody out there has these annual passes or these annual memberships that if they buy it, they're using it, mm -hmm. right? It's not one of these ones that the guy just throws it down and just shows up once a month to go play. That is not really what you're gonna find with these programs, at least not in our experience, right, Mikey? 
Yeah, there's zero breakage involved in any of these programs, definitely. And we are limited because the only thing we have to sell is time. And that time is limited, you know, so mm -hmm. definitely. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. you know, so there's a lot of people out there saying, so what do we do, right? And I think a part of the reason why you know, people gravitate to these types of programs because they don't maybe understand how to market. They don't understand how to create an experience to uh, acquire customers. Uh, we use the word reload, um, you know, at yeah, times, yeah. you know, because when we go into a golf course and either has a poor reputation or no reputation, and then you start to, you know, get momentum and momentum, you know, at first you just have to accumulate customers. And sometimes you have to target people based on price, right? Yeah. And, and obviously there's a lot of people out there that are cringing saying that's the worst customer load. Like there's a lot of truth, but when you need customers, you need customers, right? Right. And that's you attract it and then you win them over. And then, you know, as, as, as the price goes up and you continue to make the property better, you reinvest into it, um, you know, the, at, the price goes up, yeah. right? And then you're still programs to play off peak that are still valuable, but then it's, we call it the reload, right? It's not personal. Um, when that experience, and there's so many people competing for that inventory, um, you can raise prices, right? Yeah. And then when you raise prices, it brings <clears throat> in a new level of people. Um, that are willing and able to pay that. And some of the people that were came in on low prices, it will shift to off peak or they'll just go find another golf course, right? Mm -hmm. But you can't do that in, unless you know how to market and create an experience to create a loyal following. Yeah, and I think it's it's really important to touch on what you just said with the marketing side of it. You know, in, a, in this day and age with technology being as important as it is, um, depending on what the demographics are, I mean, golf's been booming. A lot more younger people are picking it up. A lot more people that really had written golf off, whatever it is. And I think it's no secret anymore that in every business, word of mouth marketing is by far the most effective. I mean, I challenge you to think, how many times have you gone and eaten at a restaurant because someone told you it was great. Someone mm. told you to try this pizza. Someone said, go to this brewery because their beer is cool or they got lawn games or whatever it is. And while marketing is really important and it's something that's not done in golf and we think that we do a pretty dang good job with it, there's nothing more valuable than actually delivering, like we've talked about before, on the great experience, on the happy environment, on the cool customer service. Because when people leave feeling like they got uh, the right amount of bang for their buck. Yeah. Um, they're going to go home. They're going to tell their friends. They're going to bring their family out when they're visiting. Those people are going to go home, tell their friends when they, hey, when you vacation, go to this place, go check this out. And it just kind of snowballs. And that's the type of stuff you can't get if you have an annual membership where the locals or people live there. They can book midnight the night that it opens up. They take yeah. the same tea time every single day throughout. And you have these blocks and people just can't get exposed exactly. to your product. Yeah, it's tough to reload when you don't have any inventory. It's taken up yeah. with the same group of people. And yeah. Mikey, I mean, talk about reload, you know, it's, we've been at PBN now, no, 10, 12 years now, and uh, we've had several reloads, you know, and, 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 and when we got there uh, a long time ago, they had annual members, right? And it was a financial disaster. And it doesn't mean that, that the people were bad, it, by any means, there were some wonderful people and it was an emotional time sure. and so, you know, you, you talk about like, what do you do, right? Because the perception is there's a lot of golf course operators out there that may be listening and saying, but what happens if I do that? If I raise the price of the annual membership or pass, or if I move them to off peak times, they're all going to quit. They're all going to quit. They're all going to quit. Right? Well, first thing you have to do is make the experience great. Yes. And the second thing is you have to have some confidence in your product, your service, and even the ability to bring new customers in. And at some point I can tell you this, if you don't change, and you have the same group of people paying the same amount or just a small increase every year because expenses go up, how do you expect them to, things to change? Yeah. Right? They just don't. Yeah. And Mikey, you know, at PBN, I mean, you know, just, it, I mean, the demand's off the charts, right? Well, I mean, I could just speak for all three here in, in South Florida, for example, like I, I went in and they tried to expense manage all of their properties um, by just you know, peeling the paint off the wall and actually watching every little expense without ever really investing anything into improving the experience too. And we're not ones to tell you that you need a new clubhouse and you need brand new greens and you need all of this to actually build it and they will come. We build it up first. We build it up first through promotional based pricing, through getting new people there, through putting smiles on people's faces. And then when the money comes in, you do have to actually reinvest some of that money to improve the experience to ultimately get to the to the highest and best value of that property. When it gets back to the re reload, 
Yeah, we probably reloaded more than any golf course probably here in South Florida or maybe the entire state. But we've also had the greatest amount of customer retention. And that's why we're at such a level um, here where it's just been incredible. I mean, our overflow in capacity is through the roof. And that was just from initially putting smiles on people's faces, creating a culture people wanted to be a part of, creating an experience that was actually personal um, and fun and cool and be who you want to be. And then we redid our greens and then we redid our bunkers and then we put a basketball hoop in and then we put a tiki bar in and then we improved the driving range. And so now this experience went from when I was here, a $40 experience all day long to now an $89 experience because the conditions are better. The experience is way better. You actually start on time, you play in four hours. So all of those things actually just add value, add value. Some cost money, some don't. But um, through a good blend of both customer retention and then reloading the ones that are just, you know, either un unwilling, unable, or even bad for the culture. Like, listen, you know, I mean, a customer can be as bad for a culture as um, an employee. Like if they want to come in and crap all over your staff and crap all over your starter and just get, you know, you know, that's that's bad. That's bad for the vibe, man. And we got to shift it into somebody that's actually excited and happy to be here because we've got a line of folks that want to do that. So it's yeah. a really cool blend, man. No, I'm, I'm really happy you brought up the customer retention, too, because I can understand how like people might be listening, hearing us talk about reload. Yeah, yeah. And we don't mean just get rid of everyone. Exactly. In fact, yeah, yeah. And, and where I'm going with this is a lot of the doomsday thinking you talked about, Joe, where people aren't confident. They don't think that their product's worth it. Or what if they try to go what they think it's worth and everybody leaves? And you have to kind of be willing to take that leap, because if you've done everything in your power to take a genuine interest in the customers. Yeah to have their best interest, to have your staff's best interest, to have the team and everybody and do kind of what we've talked about, you know, just be great people, be cool, you know, have a great attitude and deliver a worthwhile product. You would be shocked how many of those people will walk in and they'll say, oh, good for you guys. I've been waiting for this. Like you deserve it. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's way more people that are going to stick around. They're just proud and they're going to say, hey, you know what? I'm going to pay $10 more this week, but you guys did so much with so little before. Well, how are you going to do now that you're crushing it? I can't wait to see what's coming. Yeah, absolutely. And you really are going to keep. And that's where we talked about in the beginning. There's actual loyal customers buried in there who went there because it was great value and it was a great deal. But they're also going to stick around because they feel a part of the team and the culture like Mikey absolutely. talked about. And if you can't come out and kind of believe that your products are worth it when you need to make that price hike, no one else is going to. It has yeah. to start with you. Absolutely. And I, I couldn't agree more. And, you know, so when we talk about reload too, it's not just, it's not really just some global like customers, like we're reeling all the customers are no good. It actually is very little of that. It's actually, actually reloading the story. Yeah. You know, every golf course has a story, right? And then when you build momentum, the culture changes, you reload to a new story, a new model. And you know what? Certain, certainly after investments made and demand goes up, of course, there's prime times, prices can go up and then you reinvest and do that and you reload, reload. So, you know, it's a process that you have to go through. And if you're struggling out there and you have these annual memberships, you have to just give it some thought and you have to go ahead and actually put an infrastructure to go. And if not, you're just going to get the same results over and over and over. And uh, so, you know, that really goes to business model too. And we're just going to touch on it here a little bit because we're going to have future episodes talking mm -hmm. about business model, right? We have uh, golf courses in Maui. We have one in Las Vegas. It's very high end and it's cool. It's right next to uh, Manly Bay. Um, we have three in South Florida. You know, uh, one is, uh, uh, they're all very different, right? Um, and then PBN and then uh, Dobson, right? So you don't want to go ahead and just, if you have multiple golf courses, just to go ahead and just use the same business model mentality, mm -mm. right? And here is the recipe for guaranteed failure. You go into a new market and you try to go ahead and duplicate the business model of the failing golf course down the street, right? Yeah. So they go in there and they say, well, I'm going to undercut their annual membership by 50 bucks. You know what I mean? But they're failing. You yeah. know what I mean? We don't, why would you do that? Right? So I think the first step is you look at, you know, who is your customer now? Who could you be your customer tomorrow? And who's going to be your customer in five years, right? Mm -hmm. If when the culture changes, the product gets better, right? So, yeah. you know, Drew, you've seen it at Dobson, right? There is the year round, there is the snowbird, mm -hmm. and then there is the vacation person, right? Totally. The, the expectation, pricing, thought process is different from all of them, right? For sure. And, and it really does boil down to what we've always talked about, you know, on the show and Paradigm as a company, we are just out to make sure people are 
paying as much as they are willing and able to pay. Yeah. We're not here to just try and gouge people and almost say, well, I don't, yeah, you know, whatever it is, because there are people that come in from out of town for the waste management open that come for spring training that come because they're retired or they own five dealerships up in Canada or whatever right, yeah. it is. And to them coming to Dobson and they're like, dude, I would pay a hundred dollars to play here. If, you know what I mean? Like it's just that fun or that's how much it means to them. Cause yeah. in reality down the road this time of year, everywhere else is, $200 right, right. or it's $400 to go play the stadium course or whatever it is. And if you don't know the market around you, yeah. um, I had a really good friend back in college. His name's Nick Lovano. He's doing a really, really good job in real estate. Um, but he surrounded himself with people and what he would always say. And he'd been taught was if you do what other people do and say what they say, you're going to end up with what they end up with. So to your point, yeah, yeah. if you come into a market where there's some really high end golf, there's a great mix and there's some low end golf and there's uh, you know, a four whatever it is, but you go and you mirror the failing golf courses and you actually yeah. get a worse plan. What do you expect is going to happen? Exactly. You can't fill the place for near free and expect to improve the margins. Yeah. You know, so definitely keeping all that stuff in mind and just kind of ans asking questions. And a lot of it goes back to what we talked about too taking a genuine interest in the customer. When you answer the phone, asking them how their day is, asking where they're coming from, it'll help you kind of suss out oh, of course. what it is they can afford, what their expectations are. Some people, I mean, we have people call in saying they're coming, they're looking for 36 holes. So we book them in the morning, we do the afternoon, we'll do an all day raid, it includes the food, like we'll, we'll tailor it to them. And it's important to have those kinds of thoughts and that freedom to make those packages Absolutely. because you know what's in your best interest versus, oh, well, I've got this annual membership and it's $3,000 for the year and it's, but I'm only here for two months. Yeah, yeah. It's never going to work for that person, but you're good. You could lose out on a great customer. Absolutely. You know, Mikey, you're going through this now, right? It, uh, the golf course has never been better. You made the investment and you know, it, it, it's all about value. And you know what, if you price it too high, it, people don't come. Right. And you know, Mikey recently right. was a little concerned because he thought that, you know, 89 or 99 might be too much at Palm Beach national. And I said, Mikey, I said, and it, someone that's coming from out of town to come to Palm Beach, Florida, stay in a hotel that's probably three to $500 a night and go on the fancy dinners. If we treat them nice, the golf course is in great shape. It's more than fair, right? Is someone that's going to play four Absolutely. times a week year round going to pay that? No, it's because it doesn't make financial sense to them or they can't afford it. But Mikey, you've seen great results with, with, with that, right? We have a hundred percent. And you know, as you, as you guys are talking, you know, the one thing that really just, uh, just eats at me is when a golf course, uh, owner or operator just says, well, if we did 40,000 rounds and we just raised the price by five bucks, that's 200 grand, you know, to the bottom line right there. So just raise the prices and, uh, to just uh, kind of talk about how like it, it, it's simple or it's easy. Um, when there's so many steps to get it to actually raise the price. And in fact, there are times where you can sell it for more and there are times where you need to sell more of it yeah. and to find that really cool blend. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that we had did because our demand was so high was our pre-booking. And um, it's such a huge advantage to be able to schedule a month in advance and get that dedicated tea time that you love, whether it be 830 every morning on a Wednesday. Our demand is so high that we do charge a small premium for that. And people are more than willing to pay for it because they actually realize they never have to worry about what their tea time is again. They don't have to call in. They don't have to go at 840. It's 830 every day. They pay a small premium upgrade for it. And they see a huge value in that because they understand our demand as well. Yeah. And uh, it's all about a value added to it, to them. Um, clearly people perceive this golf course as at least a $64 golf course because that's what our player's card rate is. And people are more than genuinely happy to actually pay that because they know what they're getting for it. Yeah. And, they, so, and they're willing to pay 64 because they're going to play four times, but there's also a lot of people that would pay 89 or 99 because they, they're going to have a wonderful time. Right. And they're only going to play it once or 100%. twice. So, you know, and they're, they're, the one market that this, when it comes to model and it comes to like having various groups is Las Vegas, uh, Bali high. It's a premier experience. It's amazing. We're understanding who's coming to town, you know, and I think that we've always done very good in Las Vegas because we didn't look at it as year round rates. The rate could be different in March on a Tuesday and a Thursday based on convention business mm -hmm. and it's based on demand. And so you have to look at it like a stock market. You have to look at it up 
up and down in demand. And if you don't, if you have a traditional mindset in a market like that, you will get crushed, yeah. right? Because there are people that just do not care how much, they just wanna play at a time, right? Mm -hmm. And there's people that care how much, but, and they're flexible on the time. So training your team, understanding your business model and how you're gonna use that is, is a key to the success of any golf property. And I think it's just understated and it's, you know, don't go create some just program um, that you don't really understand. And you know, it's, you gotta be able to sell it, but you also, it also has to make sense. For sure. So, uh, we're gonna take a quick break. And then when we come back, we're gonna have a little bit of laugh here. We're gonna look at a few products that was just launched at the PGA Merchandise Show, which we've never attended. Nope. And- uh, I didn't even know they had it. <laughs> yeah. And it's not <laughs> because hey, we're that record, cool. I've been there a couple of times. <laughs> Loved it, was very cool, highly informative. Uh, uh, but yeah, no, it was cool, actually. I have been to the one here. Uh, I didn't know that. Couple well, of well, see, that's how much I care. But anyway, so we're gonna actually <laughs> launch uh, the first ever cool, not cool. Yeah. So we'll be back in a minute. Slide a pro out of the sleeve and grab my big stick, baby, would you please? Lay it down on the tee, bring the heat, Titleist three, me and my pro. I pray I bust it straight and stay away from the lake. Gotta keep my pearl dry. Now that you're looking all shiny and sweet, you know how I'm gonna tee you high. And let her fly for me, my pro V, my pro V, just me and my pro V. Let her fly for me, my pro V, my pro V, just me and my pro V. Won't you fly with me, fly with me, as far as we can go. Won't you fly with me, fly with me, straight into the hole. Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, so just like Joe talked about before we went to the break, we're gonna go ahead and have a little fun here. We're gonna go and do our first round of cool or not cool. Uh, I think it was this past weekend, the PGA had their new show. Uh, I don't even know what it was. They talked about new products coming to market uh, for golf courses, operators, everybody. Uh, yeah, they really picked the right guy to announce yeah, these. Exactly, so it's yeah. gonna be cool for you guys will understand it all great. We've got three things that we picked out. Um, we're just gonna talk about whether or not we think they're cool or not, uh, if we care or not, and just kind of what uh, what our thoughts are. So the first thing we're going to go over, it's called the robo cart and not rowboat cart, but robo like robot. Um, these are at Disney from what the video showed. And uh, these are super cool, I think. Um, and I'm not biased, but these carts, you throw your bag on it. It's like a normal push cart. Um, they've always had ones with remotes, but these ones have a little transmitter. You clip it to your belt or wherever, and it just follows you around. It's got an ice chest. It's got the sand holders. It's got USB chargers for your phone. I didn't see anything about speakers on there. Um, but yeah, these are just basically automated caddies. They follow you around and, uh, I'm going to open it up to you guys. Is it going to be cool or not cool? I'll start, I'm going for me, definitely not cool, but to go through all that work to not be able to carry your bag, just take a golf cart. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't think people that are gonna walk mind pushing a little cart or the other way. I think it's a lot of technology, don't want anything on my belt, the lack of speakers, who knows? What if you go up hills, can end up in a bunker? Not cool. <laughs> yeah, what happens if you walk into the bunker? Does it follow you in? Does it know when to stop? I mean, and the wheels on this thing, like, well, we'll play a clip for you guys too to see it. Uh, the wheels are like big. They're not like push cart wheels. They're like uh, golf cart ones. They're big, they're rubber. Uh, they could be all terrain for all I know. Yeah, I'm gonna go team not cool also. Yeah. If you're gonna walk, you might as well push a cart. Like yeah. get a little bit more exercise. I don't know. I'm kind of against the more technology advanced things in golf. Yeah. About about traditional, what, I don't know. What about you, Ryan? <laughs> I must be boring too, because I don't know if I'd go for that. I'm saying <laughs> not cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, Mikey? <laughs> fine. So I'm going with a don't care. Um, <laughs> although I, I take a cart personally just for shade because I need the roof. So unless it's got an umbrella on it that actually cover me from the sun. And secondly, they, they're trying to compare it to like taking a caddy, but there's nothing that compares to a caddy talking shit to you, telling you how bad that last shot was. So yeah, that's a good unless point. Unless it could talk shit and, to, and bust your chops, 
Yeah. Not cool. Maybe it's really elementary. Maybe I just haven't grown up. I think I just want to be clear. The only reason I'm really giving it a cool is because I want to know if Janae and I run at each other, like down the <laughs> fairway, give each other a high five, but in the same line, are they going to joust? Like, will they run into each other? Can they take it? Um, it's a lot safer than like hitting your buddy with a golf cart like a lot of people do nowadays. So for that regard, that's why I think it's cool. You're saying cool, though, because you'd like to see him climb. Dude, like battle bots? <laughs> <laughs> exactly, battle bots. If yeah, yeah. Because if these be like public, battle like, bots you out get, there, you dude. get your own attachments. I've been sober bots. for oh my God. I've been sober for 15 years, but I can tell you that my big problem with this thing is that cooler did not look big enough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would have been bad. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Next one, Drew. All right. Um, the next one is going to be an automated picker. Um, for those of you who might not know what that is, every driving range, you hit the balls out there. You have to get those balls back clean them, put them back in your machine. Typically that's done by one of your outside service staff or somebody else who drives a cart around, it picks the balls, they take them manually, load them up. Um, and this setup, it has an automated picker. It's probably made by Tesla or something crazy. <laughs> there's a little, there's a little couple wheels on a, that pull a little trailer that does the picking for you. It's completely GPS, um, looks like the Roomba for driving ranges. Um, and you can set the time that you want it to go pick. Uh, it drives over to wherever your, your setups located it just drops the balls out of the bottom onto a conveyor belt goes through a washer up into the machine and then ready to be resold to the next golfer um so who wants to start it off with cool or not cool Janae, you know, letter for technology advanced things i kind of just badged or bagged on i kind of think that's cool like i'm not gonna lie i mean i don't like the whole like taking a job from a kid but if this is more accurate than having to send somebody out in the picker and like letting them be out there for like two hours and yeah they could be doing other stuff like cleaning golf carts or something. So I don't know. I think it's kind of cool. One cool. Yeah. yeah. Mikey, what do you think, bro? I think it's uh, it's a definitely a cool concept, but takes all the fun out of it, man. I love smashing stingers at the friggin' range, <laughs> kid, dude. It was awesome, man. Yeah. Well, hey, it's you know it's short. Plus, enough. I love Dolly Mon here at the Nash. I love my Dolly Mon who does my range every day. He's hardest working guy in town. I can't I can't do that to the Dolly Mon. So I'm gonna pass on it. Not cool. You could get a fat head of him and put that on like a stick on it, so people can still aim at him. Yeah. You know what I mean? And then this is how we find yeah. out what he's made of. He keeps the job because now instead of being on the range working he's working the range line cleaning clubs selling more food having fun running games that's how he gets creative man yeah. i am actually going to go with cool because well i right. do want to cost somebody their job you know <laughs> since you know we own the company you know what i mean no, i'm just kidding you. not really but kind of because you know what this machine also won't do? Show up late, show up hungover, Ooh. harass other team members, make lame excuses you know what I mean? It looks pretty good to me. Yeah. Actually, I'm just wondering, are they coming out with something that could work in the golf shop also? <laughs> Oof, I'd be scared. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if it would ever fit in our brand anyways, because that'd kidding. be pretty tough. Yeah. Uh, my question to you though is, do you still need somebody to be responsible to plug it in? Is it gas operated? Yeah. That's what I don't know too, because even if yeah. the machine no. doesn't show up late, someone could forget to plug it in. Full disclosure that although I like to save, you know, the job, no minimum wage going up, injuries, it's a tough job and everything. We would not plug it in. Um, yeah. It would get <laughs> exactly. stolen or broken, and we'd be back to kid picking it. We spend twelve or twenty-five thousand, whatever it probably is. So, uh, sure. I'm going to go back. I'm going to flip my answer to not cool. Ryan, <laughs> bring us home. Oh boy, I got to bring you home on this one. I don't. I like the idea of it. If, uh, like you said, you take that range, range kid, man, girl, whatever they are out yeah. there picking up golf balls my childhood job and, and move them in front of people or interacting with people, cleaning the clubs and, and, uh, helping them out that way. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's cool or not cool. Don't, don't well, but you care though. I care. So yeah. you don't not, know is what I was going to say. Is there a fourth option uh, of don't I think know? You're leaning towards cool <laughs> or not cool because depends you want on the, the operator. Yeah, yeah. The operator, the, the golf course owner, yeah. Take that child or, or kid no, or man or whatever. <laughs> oh, he's tugging on the heart strings. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, no. All right. And the third one, it is the Focus Golf Target. Um, I'm going to do my best to describe these. They're basically circular targets. Uh, they look kind of like a funnel. It looked like they're about 10 feet wide. Um, bright like colors. Yeah, like a snow cone holder upside yeah. down, whatever it is. Uh, like the water cups, too, they have on yeah, golf yeah, courses. Yeah. Um, they're the four bright colors, red, green, blue, and yellow. You set them at different distances. 
Um, and uh, yeah, it just looks like it's a target for people to hit balls into. Um, it says they're bright. It keeps the attention of juniors. I wonder how they came to that conclusion. Um, Harvard who, study. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I made you bring it home last time, Ryan, but you start us off with this one. I like the idea. I, I like having something out there fun to hit at, hit at that's a little bigger than uh, a tiny little hole. I yeah. agree. Uh, Mikey? Uh, cool idea. Great idea. Faulty design. Number one, they're only six feet in diameter. Oof. And anybody to be able to hit a six foot diameter target from even 40 yards is impossible. Believe me, I've got my own things out there that people love to hit. So faulty design, they need to be about 30 feet in diameter to actually make them small, cool. Small increase. And secondly, they don't make any noise, dude. No noise, no coolness. They at least have to have like a siren on it when a ball goes in. So people get excited, jump up and down and, you know, that would make it cool. Yep. So it's halfway there. Mikey, you read my mind. I was going to say cool. something similar. Really cool idea, really terrible execution because it's too small. I've got no hope to hit it. And not only that, but if you, for the normal size of a driving range, you need like 70 of them because you can't have the entire range aiming at one row. Um, and then there's no bang. People are hitting at targets to get that satisfaction. They want to know they made it. They don't want to guess. Did I get in? Uh, did you get in? Uh, it totally was in. It could have gone long, whatever it is. And and, uh, you know, it's better to know they're not that big. I don't know how you turn that thing upside down and get the balls out. Um, but because there's no noise and they're too small, I'll never hit it. I'm going to go not cool. I'm kind of on the fence. I'm thinking logistically, you know, if well, also we thought they were 10 feet in diameter. They first. are just they're very bad li uh, like observers. They are. There is a 10 footer. There's a oh, 10 footer. Okay. okay. We're both right. Well, but there's it's still a third sizes. of what Mikey wants. <laughs> <laughs> Do they funnel into a bucket at the bottom? Do they sit in the thing? Because sitting in the thing, like in the bottom, if it's like a snow cone, the way that is yeah. towards the bottom, how do you get them out? I that think sounds there's like a, hole. a pain in the butt. I think they fall through the hole how big in the is, bottom. How big is this bucket? How often do you have to change it? It's no bucket. I think like, this falls onto the ground. Oh. Yeah. You gotta like move them then to like. I would say it has to be not cooled for you to I, give it this yeah, much thought. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's probably not cool. Yeah. But it's made out of like parachute or something like that. Uh, know. You know what? If it is, maybe you can flip it inside out, but then that really doesn't help you. It just throws them all yeah, on the ground exactly. anyways. I saw a flag stick through it, so I think it goes yeah. through a hole in the bottom just onto the range. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Joe, what are, what are you? It seems kind of obvious where you're going. <laughs> Uh, I like it. I, I agree with the small and all that, but I think we're thinking it from our carnival experiences at the driving range. That's I think fair. for a normal driving range, I'm going to say definitely cool. For us, it's not that we're that cool, but we definitely need the features you guys talked about it. So for everyone else, I think it's cool for us. I'd say bigger, noisier, definitely to be cool. Yeah. And here's another thing. Would it work <laughs> with the automated picker? Because yeah. if you need a kid to flip it inside out or a person, A, that's liability. They got You either got to stop the range while they're outside of the cage or your automated thing just can't pick them up and then your targets are full of balls that can't do anything and you're out of balls. Yeah. Well, I think that maybe we could have these uh, companies send it. We could have like uh, uh, the battle box, right? <laughs> <laughs> In between the targets, right? Yeah. And then people can dodge balls on the scooter thing that we did look at first, right? The cart? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Bring them so, all together. Exactly. Um, reviews for them. Yeah. yeah. So I want to hear from you guys. Go ahead and leave us a comment below um, what you thought was the coolest of the three of those, or if you even thought any of them were cool. And if you have an idea, because we know there's tons of smart people out out there, tons of great people with great insight. Um, tell us what you think your million dollar idea would be. What would you like to see at next year's uh, PGA showcase? Um, yeah. Absolutely. Well, thanks for listening or watching. Thank you, Janae and Ryan. Mikey D out in FLA. Drew, we'll see you guys next week. to the green and the P to the B.